for. But let's grab our Bibles this morning and turn to Isaiah 51. Isaiah 51. We're going to look at uh, the first seven verses of that chapter. Isaiah is a great uh, book of the Bible. You know, it's kind of like a mini Bible. There's 66 chapters. There's 66 books of the Bible, so kind of some parallels with the 66 there. And you have Isaiah 51, verses 1 through 7, kind of uh, toward the end of it. You only have about, uh, what is that? There'd be uh, 15 chapters left <laughs> uh, from there. So Isaiah 51, verses 1 through 7. If you don't have a Bible, there is a Bible beneath you. should be one in every rack. Uh, and there's some large print floating around. There's a large print per row. should be at least two. So you can find that if you need the larger print there. Isaiah 51, verses 1 through 7. Let's read the whole text, and then we'll give you the title this morning. The Bible says, Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness. Ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bare you. For I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving, and the voice of melody. Hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation, for a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, and mine arm shall judge the people, and the isles shall wait upon me, and on mine arm shall they trust. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look upon the earth beneath, and, to, and the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell there, there shall die in like manner, but my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, that the people in whose heart is my law. Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be afraid of their revi rev revilings. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I want to preach a message which I've entitled, Why We Listen to God. Three times in our text, he said, hearken to me, listen to me. Why should we listen to God? Now, it almost would go without saying we ought to listen to God, but I'm going to give you kind of three reasons why we should listen to God. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, would you direct with your word, would you show us something out of this passage, help us to live according to Isaiah 51, verses 1 through 7, help us to live right here in these verses and understand why we ought to listen to God. And if there's anyone who is not listening to God, would you make that clear to them and help them to open their ears to the voice of God. We thank you for it, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We must listen to God. Listening to God requires a deliberate choice to shut out the chaos around you and to focus your thoughts. Is God someone you can hear? The Bible says he is, and the Bible's one, and the main tools through which he speaks. I mean, uh, arguably, before we talk about anything else uh, this morning about listening to God, we listen to God primarily through his word. I mean, that's the, the primary ideal way God has chosen to speak to us. He's completed it, given it to us in our language, which we enjoy. Even in Sunday school, we entertain the thought that there's still people that don't have a Bible in their native language, yet we've got many, many, many translations of our English language. We've got so many Bibles coming out of our ears in America, and we're so privileged and it's just an amazing thing that we have the Bible in our native tongue. There's some groups that don't have that, yet we have the Bible. We listen to God through his word primarily. We live in a world of noise. Almost everywhere we go, we find sounds competing with our minds, keeping us by, with, uh, from letting our thoughts get below to surface level. Hearing God's voice means not listening to the noise of the world around us. It's not easy, but it can be done. You know, many of us, we turn on the, the TV, we turn on the world, we, we are influenced by society and cultural uh, 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 just perspectives, and we let that guide how we think and how we speak and how we operate, and we listen to that over God's voice. If it goes against God's word, it's, it's wrong. It's, it's not what he has intended. Habakkuk 2.1 says, I will stand upon my watch and set upon uh, the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I'm reproved. Uh, Habakkuk says, I want to listen to God. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to listen for him to speak to me. I'm ready to hear what God says. Speak, Lord, in the stillness while I wait on thee. Hush my heart to listen in expectancy. Uh, speak, O blessed master, in this quiet hour. Let me see thy face, Lord. Feel thy touch of power. For the words thou speakest, they are life indeed, living bread from heaven. Now my spirit feed. All to thee is yielded. I am not my own. Blissful, glad surrender. I am thine alone. Speak, thy servant heareth. Be not silent, Lord. Waits my soul upon thee for thy quickening word. 
You know, you know what it was spoken of of teenage prostitutes? It, they were asked in interviews in San Francisco in this study, and they were saying, uh, what, what, is there, what is something that you needed that you could not get? And most of their response was this. In, in, invariably, they, it was something to the effect of, I, I wanted somebody to listen to me, someone who cared enough to listen to me. You know, when we give an ear to someone, when we actually care to, to listen to what someone has to say, it shows a great deal of our care for them, and often then garners us to speak more to them because it shows that we care. Uh, many people were so busy with our life that we don't get, take time to listen. We don't take time to listen to God or we listen to others, and it shows we really don't care. If we don't take time to listen to God, what does that convey to God? Now, I know that God's not uh, kind of um, influenced by how we act in a sense that where he's still God, he's still in control, he still is all that he is in his character, but, you know, we don't like necessarily make him sad. Uh, but, you know, how does that... How should that make us feel when we won't even listen to God? We don't, we don't take time for him to listen to what he says. Well, it's, an, it's an amazing thing. We listen to God because, number one, where we came from. Where we came from. Look at verse 1. Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence ye were hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye were digged. Uh, are digged. Now, I want to I, I, you know, talk about the immediate context. Now, we're talking about... Abraham and Sarah to the Jewish people. That's the immediate context to these Jewish people. Uh, that, that's who we're talking about. He said, hey, look at where I made you a nation. I gave uh, Sarah, who was uh, without a child, I gave her a child, and I multiplied that seed. So in the context, he's definitely talking about their Jewish heritage through Adam and Sarah. It's mentioned in verse 2. That's the immediate context. Now, I'm going to make an application to it, but I want to tell you first what it's talking about so you know how to properly understand your Bible. But to this Jewish believer, the immediate context implies the wonder involved in the origin of Israel itself as the ground of faith in its restoration and perpetuity. This rock is, of course, Abraham, and the pit is Sarah, where God brought a child out of a childless parents uh, that were looking for a child. You know, verse 2, look to Abraham, your father. He compares the bodies of Abraham and Sarah under a rock and a pit, a quarry out of which the stones were hewn or dug out, thereby implying that God, in some sort, actually did what John the Baptist said he was able to do in Matthew 3, 9. That he was able to raise up stones uh, that would be the children of Israel. You know, God can do it. He, he hewned out the people. And I remember a couple Sundays ago, or at some point, someone asked me, you know, why are the Jewish people God's people? And I really didn't have an answer for it. It's just how God decided that it was his people. He would take just a kind of an unknown people that had no children and make them uh, of, of seed that has been blessed and establish his people, and say that, and so he could declare, that's my people. There's nothing special about them. They weren't great in uh, military might. They weren't great in uh, intellectual thought, but they're, they're my people. But isn't that an amazing thing? Because God took just a, an unknown people group and made them his people, and yet he does that through salvation all the time for us. He takes an unknown person and saves them and calls them a child of God. By application, this language is, is often used as addressed to Christians, which in view is to produce humility by reminding them that they've been taken from God from a state of sin and raised up, as it were, from a deep and dark pit of pollution. Hey, where did God bring you out? He brought you down from the bottom, from that miry clay. In Psalm 42, it says, He brought me out also up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, out of that muck and mire of the ground, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. God put me on stable ground. Hey, before I was saved, it was unstable. It was, it, was, it was muck and mire. I was wallowing in sin, and God saved me and put me on a solid rock. And the Bible says when he did that, he put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. The Bible also goes on to say, Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. I want you to turn over to Psalm 18, 16. You're in Isaiah here, so just go back a couple books. Psalm 18, 16. Look at this psalm. Psalm 18, verse 16. The Bible says, He sent from above, He took me, He drew me out of many waters. So you're in Psalm 18, go to Psalm 69. Psalm 69. All through Psalms, they sang about what God had did for them. Psalm 69. 69.14, the Bible says, Deliver me out of the mire, and let not me sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me, and out of the deep waters. You know, you know it's amazing. God brought me out through salvation, but sometimes I can get sucked back in, can I? I can, I can sink back down in that mire. And, and, and the psalmist says, hey, bring me out of it again. You saved me, but I, I need to be established again. I'm sinking back down in the old ways. Go over to Psalm uh, uh, 27. 
Psalm 27, and look at verse 5. Psalm 27, verse 5. The Bible says here in Psalm 27, verse 5, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, he shall set me up upon a rock. Upon a rock. You don't have to turn there, but there's many more. Psalm 61, 2, From the end of the earth where I cry unto thee, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. We need to be established upon that higher rock. You know, later on in Matthew, he would go on to say, Jesus Christ would say, Therefore, whosoever heareth these things of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock, a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, trouble and problems came at me, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell not, because it was founded upon a rock. When you stop trusting in Jesus Christ, the rock of our salvation, the rock and foundation of our faith, the gospel uh, uh, which saved us, when you stop trusting in him, that's when you fall apart. That's when your family will fall apart. That's when your life will fall apart. When you're not established on that rock that he brought you out on, and you go back into the muck and mire of the world. Psalm 17.5 says, says, Hold up my goings in my paths, that my footsteps slip not. You know, sometimes you, know, you can be on that solid rock, but when the rains come, the rock gets a little slippy. Actually, that's the most dangerous part of rock hunting is when it rains. Often you can find better stuff, but it's really slippy. And those rocks can be sharp at times. If you're not careful, you need God to say, hey, I'm on this rock, but it's, it's feeling kind of slippery. Uh, the problem's in the rain. It's raining all around me. I need you to establish my foot here. You know, in Psalm 37, 23, it says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. I need to make sure I'm on that rock, and I stay on that rock, and I stay on that path so I can follow God. Because I need to remember where God's brought me from and where he's taken me to even. How can the reality of God be seen in everyday life? How can we uh, establish ourselves on this rock? Now, uh, for many of us, it started at salvation, but have you gotten back into the mire? God calls, enables, and empowers, and invites you to live on mission uh, right where he has you, right in your own home, right at your own marriage and job and community and church. God's called you to, to stand for him right now. Be on that rock right now. You're not to, to be in the muck and mire with the world. And if you're in the job world and you're, you have employment, you're not to get in the muck with them. You're to be on the rock, which is not necessarily above them, but it's the higher calling. It's the establishment. God's put you on that solid foundation. Don't get back in the muck and mire. Living life on mission isn't a position or calling for someone else. It's your calling. Each of us comes equipped with a special set of gifts. With that comes a special set of weaknesses. Nevertheless, the strengths and weaknesses are meant to be lived out in the church and in our homes as we're on that solid rock. It's for all of us to do. My heart was distressed neath Je Jehovah's dread frown, and low in the pit where my sins dragged me down. I cried to the Lord in the deep miry clay, who tenderly brought me out to golden day. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on a rock to stay. He puts a song in my soul today, a song of praise. Hallelujah. He placed me upon the strong rock by his side. My steps were established, and here I'll abide. No danger or falling while here I remain, but stand in his grace until the crown I gain. He gave me a song, t'was a new song of praise. By day and by night its sweet notes I will raise. My heart's overflowing, I'm happy and free. I'll praise my Redeemer who has rescued me. I'll sing of his wondrous mercy to me. I'll praise him till all men his goodness shall see. I'll sing of salvation at home and abroad till many shall hear in the truth and trust in God. I'll tell of the pit with its gloom and despair. I'll praise the dear Father who answered my prayer. I'll sing my new song and a glad story of love, then join in the chorus with the saints above. He brought me out of the miry clay. You know, the Bible says that we need to listen to God because we need to remember the rock which we were hewn and the pit which we were dragged out, where we were digged out. Praise God for that. Praise God for the Jewish people becoming a people for God. And then we as Gentiles were grafted in. We, we need to remember where we came from. We need to remember where we came from. If you're too careful, you'll have religion stuffed up your nose and it'll make it stick up before others. You got to be humble before others and recognize where God has brought us from. You know, there's some people in our church that aren't there yet. They're still growing. And, and, and if you're honest with yourself, you're still growing because you've got a bad attitude about it. But we need to make sure we don't have religion stuffed on our nose when we get on that rock. When we get established, we need to re remember that we were just in that mire. We were just in that clay, that muck and mire before. So number one, we need to, we need to listen to God because of where we came from. Number two, we need to listen to God because what we have. What we have. Look back here to Isaiah 51 and look down at verse 4. The second of those hearken phrases. Number four, uh, verse 4 says, Hearken unto me, my people, 
and give ear unto me, O my nation, for a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. Now, there may be some people in our society, uh, up in the high rankings of our society, the elite, the, the rulers, the leaders, and they may, they may think that righteousness and standing for what is lawful can be subjective. Well, uh, we think this is okay. We think this is not okay. And by and large, our founding fathers based it upon the Bible. But now we, we base the law on subjectivity and opinion and feelings and not on objective truth of the Bible. You know, our founding fathers, oh, by and large, were Christians and use the Bible as the law book. If you look at most of our laws, a lot of them have foundations, at least the original ones, have foundations of what is right according to the Bible. Praise God for some of our founding fathers that stood for what is right. Now that they weren't all Christians, they didn't all do right, but a lot of them did. And praise God for some of our laws which are righteous. Now sadly, that's falling apart at the very seams, but here the Bible makes it very clear of what we have. We have the word. We don't have to wonder, what does God want me to do? What is God, uh, how does he want me to obey? What has he told me to do? God's made it very clear. He's put it in black and white so I can read it and understand it. We need to praise God for what we have. We have God's law written in black and white. We have the truth. We have the law, God's law. We have God's expectations. You know, he didn't say, you know, just kind of figure it out. Be the best Christian you think you ought to be. Just live by your feelings and just maybe hopefully you'll get it right. He said, no, I told you exactly how to live. I expect you to live this way. He's given us his expectations. We have the gospel for the world, the good news, uh, the, the law for every single person. We have the Bible. We have his word. You know, John Bunyan said, I was never out of my Bible. Boy, these, these guys of old, they, they, they had something figured out. John Wesley said, I'm a man of one book. And he was a reader, too. He was basically saying, hey, I got, I got libraries of books, but I'm a man of one book. You're a reader? You ought to be reading this primarily and put some of those other books down. Read them after you get done with this one, but you ought to be a man of one book. You might have many books, but be a person of one book. You know, someone else said, the Bible is a window into this prison world through which we may look into eternity. Timothy Dwight. U.S. Grant uh, said, uh, hold fast to the Bible as the sheet anchor of your liberties. Write its precepts in your hearts and practice them in your lives. You know, the Bible is not a single work, of, but a collection of works from a variety of human authors that God used as he inspired his word through a human instrument and author. Uh, of course, the Holy Spirit was the author, but he used human beings to write his word. It was people such as shepherds, kings, farmers, priests, poets, scribes, and fishermen. Authors also included traders, embezzlers, adulterers, murderers, and, and auditors. And yet God used all of those to collectively write one message. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is ultimately the supreme author as he inspired holy men of God to write down the words of God. Philip Brooks said, the Bible's like a telescope. If a man looks through his telescope, he sees worlds beyond. But if he looks through, at his telescope, he does not see anything but that. The Bible is a thing to be looked at through, uh, uh, through to see that which is beyond. But most people only look at it, and so they only see the dead letter. You know, a lot of people think, oh, that's a good historical book. That that's some, has some knowledge in there. Well, that book may contain God's word. It may have some truth for me, but, you know, I reject some other parts of it. No, it is God's complete objective uh, without, 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 uh, without argument. This is God's word, the whole of it. We ought to live by it. You know, someone said men do not reject the Bible because it contradicts itself, but because it contradicts them. I want you to turn to Psalm 119. Almost every verse, I think, except for one verse, talks about the Bible. Psalm 119. I really, really was tempted to read the whole thing, but it's quite a lengthy psalm. But I'll read uh, just a good portion of it. Psalm 119. Fall in love with your Bible this morning. This is what God's given us. This is what we have this morning. Psalm 119. It's, we don't need another ministry or program or function. We need more of the Bible around here. Psalm 119. That'll help you out. I might fail you, but God's word will never fail you. Psalm 119, God will never fail you. The Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 1, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, and they that seek him with their whole heart. Uh, they also do not know iniquity. They walk in his ways. These are all synonyms for the Bible. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were diligently uh, directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart. Then uh, I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. O forsake me not utterly. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. 
With my whole heart have I sought thee, O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might ask sin against thee. Blessed are thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I rejoice in the way of thy testimonies as much as all in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Deal bountifully with uh, thy servant that I may live and keep thy word. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I'm a stranger. You see what we're seeing here? Thy word, thy law, thy statutes, thy testimonies, thy word. God gave it, gave it for us. Look down at verse 41. Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, unto thy salvation according to thy word. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. And take not the word of, of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in thy judgments. So shall I keep thy law continually forever and ever. So again, thy law. And I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. I will speak thy testimonies also before kings. I will not be ashamed. Hey, that's what our government needs. Our government needs more Christians giving thy word to kings, to those in leadership. And I will delight myself in thy, thy commandments, which I have loved. And lastly here, verse 48, I'll, I'll stop reading it. I'd love to read the whole thing to you. My hands also I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and will meditate in thy statutes. Praise God for his word. Boy, Psalm 119 is a blessing. I challenge you. I had to do this in Bible college. I'd recommend it for every single member of our church. Write down every word for the Bible and go through Psalm 119. It'll take you about maybe an hour, maybe 30 minutes if you're a fast writer, and just write down all the words for the Bible. Psalm 119 is filled with principles about God's word. He loves his word so much. He's, he wants us to understand this so much. He gives us a whole book of the Bible, a whole chapter rather, uh, that talks about his word. Boy, his word. He gave it to us. Boy, what we have this morning, it's, a, it's an amazing thing what God's provided. We listen to God because, number one, of where we came from, number two, of what we have, and number three, by what we know. You can go back to uh, Isaiah 51, look at verse 7. Isaiah 51, verse 7. You know what? Let's read 5 and 6 before we get to 7. My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, and my arm shall judge the people. The isles shall wait upon me, and on my arm shall they trust. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner, but my salvation shall be forever. And my righteousness shall not be abolished. Then verse 7, lastly, we, we listen to God because what we know. Verse 7, hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness. The people in whose heart is my law. Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revilings. You know, number one, we ought to memorize. Look, look again at verse 7. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness. We have to know it, right? How's it get, got to get there? For many of us, we have to memorize it. You can't just read it one time. It, it's not there. You, you won't know it. You, you won't, it won't be internalized. So number one, you've got to memorize. This requires effort. I've got to work at knowing God's word. I've got to work at it. I, I, may, I may struggle to understand the concepts. I may need to get a dictionary out. I may need to get may, maybe a, another faithful commentary to give light on a passage. I may need to pray to the Holy Spirit to have him guide me. I may need to just sit there and meditate and think through that phrase. I may need to read it over and over and over again. I may just need to memorize it and just put it in my brain, think about it, chew on it later, get it back out after lunch and think, you know, let me think through that again. You know, let me pull my Bible out. Let me, let me get that phrase again and let me get that understanding there again. Holy Spirit, would you teach me this verse? Would you help me to live by this verse. I need to memorize ye that know righteousness. There's some of you that never read the entire Bible. You ought to. You ought, you ought to work at, at reading at least the entire Bible at least once, and then go back and read it slowly. Maybe read a chapter a day, read a couple verses a day. I remember one guy was telling, telling me how he had to read his Bible. He just recently got saved, and he said, uh, he said you know, he reads, uh, he reads a short psalm every day. There's some shorter ones in there, like six or seven verses, and he had one of them memorized. He had read it so much, he just, he just began to memorize because he repeated and repeated it. It takes effort. We not only understand, but love and practice it. Who's Persons are justified, whose nature is renewed, and whose lives are subject to my laws. We need to know what God has said. We need to know righteousness. We need to memorize it. Hearken unto me, as he says here in verse uh, 7, uh, that ye that know righteousness, the righteousness of God, and of his law, the purity of his nature, what righteousness is agreeable to him and required by him, the imperfection and insufficiency of man's own righteousness, and the glory and fullness of Christ's righteousness revealed in the gospel. And so know that, 
as to approve of it, follow after it, lay hold upon it, believe in it, and rejoice in it as their justifying righteousness. They ought to know what God has said about their righteousness. The Bible says in the New Testament, Philippians 3.8, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Aren't you thankful that you know about God? There's some people that don't know about God. I've, I've told some people the gospel before here in Staten Island, and they'd never heard it. Or maybe they didn't have a, a complete idea of it. Maybe they'd heard parts of it. Yeah, I, I heard about Jesus, but they didn't hear the whole gospel story. They didn't know it was all for them. You know, but, but, uh, but Paul says, I'm thankful that I was once killing Christians, but God saved me. Now I know about Jesus Christ, my Messiah. I know about the one who died for me, my, my Redeemer. Philippians 3.10, just a couple verses later, he said that I may know him. I want to get to know this Jesus Christ. I know a lot about God the Father. I know a little bit about the Holy Spirit, but I want to know about Jesus Christ, my Messiah. He said, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. He wasn't talking about God the Father. He was talking about the God the Son who died and rose again. I want to know about the Messiah. I rejected him. I didn't even want to think about him, but now I want to know him. I want to know him. The power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Paul said, boy, he transformed me. I got to know more about him. We, we uh, listen to God because of what we know, what we know. Number two, we internalize. Look at verse uh, 7 again. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. The people in whose heart is my law. Isn't it amazing that God made a people for his name in the Old Testament? As we already looked at that concept, it's just amazing. God declared that the Jewish people were his people. In the New Testament, then he grafts us in, he splices that Gentile branch into that olive tree, and then calls it all his people, then really declares that the whole world through him might be saved, and we're all in that family of God. We're all adopted in. That's an amazing concept. Psalm 37, 31, the law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Psalm 48, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Now, in the Old Testament, it's very clouded because they didn't have the indwelling Holy Spirit. But in that church, Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came, then we had the indwelling Holy Spirit, and now literally God puts himself in the heart of the believer when he gets saved. That was an amazing thing, the indwelling Holy Spirit to live the Christian life. Jeremiah 31, 33, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, For as much as ye are the manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. I don't know how it makes it even more clear that God said, I put the Holy Spirit of God so that you could live the Christian life and you now have, the, you have my law written inside your fleshly heart. That's an amazing thing that God did. And he did it by grace through, uh, through, through grace are you saved. Hebrews 10, 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and their minds will I write them. But that's why we have to memorize God's word. Now, we have the Holy Spirit, but he needs to remember what, what's, what's there and put it all together. Go over to Ephesians 2. If you're in Isaiah, go to Ephesians 2. And look at the amazing thing of what God's done for the Gentile. Ephesians 2. And look at uh, verse 1. Ephesians 2, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you at the quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had a conversation in times past, in the lusts of the flesh, uh, and, and uh, in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He has to make us sit together because we don't often do that. <laughs> and that in ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith. And not, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works as any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that being... Uh, 
in time past, Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made with hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. That was our condition. But now look at verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall partition between us. Hey, it was Jew-Gentile, and God broke that thing down and said, I, I want the whole world to be saved, and I'll adopt you all into my family. And, and look at verse 16. And, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Amen. You know what? Let's get 17 in there. And came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them which were nigh, Gentile and Jew. Praise God. We need to internalize this truth of God. We need to stabilize. You know, why do we fear men? You know, that, uh, I know you're not there. You're in Ephesians 2. But back in that verse, in verse 7, it says, They were to fear ye not the reproach of men. Why do we fear God? we got God on our side. We have the Holy Spirit lives and it dwells a believer. And then we fear what men can do and what men say. Don't fear men. So stabilize. And I made a new word. You've got to determinize. Determine that we're not going to be afraid when they revile you. Don't listen to men. Why do you listen to the voice of this world? they got no power over you. Jeremiah 1.17 says, therefore, uh, th Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. I I'm more powerful than mankind. Acts 5.41, They departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. 1 Peter 4.4, Wherefore, uh, wherein, they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Yeah, this world thinks we're strange. We don't run with them, but praise God, we're separate from them. God's put us on that solid rock. Hey, we listen to God, number one, because of where we came from. Number two, because of what we have. And number three, because what we know. Praise God for that. We need to listen to God. Hey, has your Bible gotten dusty? I say it all the time. You, you shouldn't just crack it open on Sunday. You should be looking at this every day, not reading the whole thing every day, but reading a little bit, Re reading a chapter, reading a couple chapters, whatever you can digest and understand and internalize, read the Bible. Don't let it get, gather dust and then, oh, Sunday morning, God dusted it off. You know, l let it be read. Understand what it says. If you've never read every word, how can you say you believe every word? You don't even know every word. You ought to, you ought to know every word, read it, understand it, internalize it, memorize it. Don't let it get dusty. Hey, I find that a marked up Bible means a solid Christian, but it, a, a clean, crisp, dusty Bible means, means a, a Christian that's just far away from God. You, you're, not put, you're not putting God's word in, in your heart. Now, many of you might do it on your phone, not, not criticizing that, but we've got to understand our Bible. Listen to it, read it, get it off that shelf and read it, open the app, look at it, understand it, memorize it, have it speak to you as you're driving or something, but we need to listen to God. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you help us, Lord, to listen to you? Lord, there's much noise in our society, and Satan loves when we don't read our Bibles. Satan loves when we don't know what you said, when we don't know all the power we have through the Holy Spirit to live this Christian life. It is provided for us to even witness the power of the gospel, the power of the, uh, of the witness inside the Holy Spirit that then takes our prayers to the throne room of God. So thankful for that earnest of salvation that eventually will then take us to heaven. We'll get that glorified body if we trust in Christ. But Lord, there could be someone here this morning that doesn't even know you as Savior. We need to start there. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Christians, pray for those around you. If you'd say to yourself in this moment, you know, I don't know if I've ever placed my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I don't know if I've ever trusted Jesus as my personal Savior. I don't know if I'm born again. I don't know if I'm a Christian. I don't know if I've ever placed my faith and trust in, in Jesus alone, not plus any works or church attendance or giving in, in, of tithes and offerings, but I've never trusted Jesus as my personal Savior. If you were to die right now, and you're not sure where you go when you die, heaven or hell, you're not sure, but you'd like to find out about that this morning, I want you to raise your hand. If you were to die right now, but you're not sure where you'd go when you die, just raise your hand. I'd like to help you with that this morning. All right, then I gather most of us are Christians, unless some of us were a little shy to admit we're lost, but we'll keep praying for you. Let me ask you a second question. Who would say this morning, you know, my Bible is, does not have that prominent place in my life as it should? You know, maybe I'm reading a couple times a week. Maybe I've just got out of my reading, but I need to listen to God. I need to open this Bible, and I, I need to understand what he said to me, what I have, where I came from, uh, what, what, what I can know in my mind. But, but the Bible is just not ha doesn't have that place where it should have 
in my, in, in my life, and it needs to be. But God's kind of shown you something about your Bible reading and memorization and, and internalizing God's Word. But you say, that's me, Pastor. Would you pray for me? The Bible's just taking a second place in my life. It needs to get back to that first place. Anybody like that? I see that hand. Hands going immediately up. You can put your hands down. Thanks for your honesty. Anybody else? Just the, the Bible needs first place. I've let something else take first place in my priorities. I maybe work or whatever. All right, Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for showing us areas where we can change and we can put the Bible as first place in our life. Lord, a lot of, a lot of pressures come in. We've got to make money. We've got to pay that rent so we have a place to stay, but sometimes even jobs and making money so we can live this life in New York City uh, just sometimes pushes out the Bible, and we need to put it back in. We, 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 can't, we can't schedule out the Bible. We, we have to schedule it, and it's got to be first and foremost. We've got to seek ye first the kingdom of God. We've got to seek him first. And, Lord, I pray you'd help us to to understand the need for the Bible to be present and first in our lives. I pray you'd help me as well to always understand that the Bible's number one. It's not about getting a sermon. It's not about getting a little thought, making a social media update. It's about reading and understanding what God says and not reading for a sermon, but reading for love of the Bible, love of God. Thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for writing your love letter to me. Thank you, Lord, for loving me, for saving me, for putting me on that solid rock. Lord, that never fails. I can slip off of it, but it's solid. It's sure. It's a foundation that cannot be removed. We thank you for it. We pray all this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.